welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. My name is Wendy Myers, and I'm a certified holistic health and nutrition coach. And today I'm interviewing Jonathan Baylor of the Smarter Science of Slim.com. And we'll, we will be taking, uh, talking about science backed facts on how to lose weight and keep it off. And for over a decade, Jonathan studied thousands of pages of academic research on health and weight loss and will be sharing his expertise on the show. So forget everything you've learned. And please keep in mind that this show is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease or health condition. The Live to 110 podcast is solely informational in nature, so please consult your healthcare practitioner before attempting any treatment you hear on this show. And I'm really excited today. I have a couple announcements. As of today, I am no longer on Blog Talk Radio where I was recording the show. It's got really, really poor sound quality and I wanted to bring the best of sound quality to you listeners because it was really beginning to to irritate me even about how badly uh, me and the guests were sounding on the show. I have also got our new microphone. It's called a Yeti. It's it's really, really big (laughs) and uh, it's almost a little intimidating. And I just wanted to bring the best in audio quality to you guys so that you can enjoy the listening experience a little better. And I'm also super excited to announce that I have a new co-host on the show. One of my besties, Kate Bien, is a fellow health coach and IIN grad and is going to be my little partner in crime from now on. Hello, Kate. How are you doing? Hi, Wendy. Hi, listeners. <laughs> I'm so excited that you agreed to be on the show because, you know, I wanted to give the listeners a little bit of entertainment and not just my usual robot routine. Hello, my name is Wendy Myers. I am a health coach. No, <laughs> just kind of getting a little boring. So I wanted to spice it up a little bit with my little girlfriend. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this with you. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Uh, you know, what are, what are you doing these days? What are you all about? Yeah, sure. Um, well, yes, I am a health coach. I graduated from IIN just like you. And I also am a fitness professional. Mm -hmm. I teach Pilates. I have, I think I actually have three certifications. I also um, teach indoor cycling at SoulCycle. And I do acting, so I am basically like Felix the Cat, (laughs) a bag of tricks. (laughs) And you do have proof that you uh, teach soul cycling because you have like a perfect toned butt. Yes, we like to call that a basketball buns if you like sliced a basketball in half and you just slapped it on someone's back. (laughs) And you also got thunder thighs. No, thunder thighs are not good. (laughs) I know some guy you dated like... Didn't yeah. he tell you you had beautiful thunder thighs? I was like, you don't want to tell a girl they have thunder thighs. Yeah, that's a big no-no. Did you ever see him again? No. No, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't either. I wouldn't do that. You don't text a girl you just met that she has thunder thighs. Hello? Yeah. So anyways, back to you. Yeah. Um, so why don't you tell everyone you know, our little story about how we met? You yeah, saw my well, little ad on Craigslist to run a yeah, room. Yeah, that's right. I was I am from New York so I was looking for a place to live and thank God I wanted to live somehow I knew that Los Feliz was cool thank God um so I was looking on Craigslist and I found your ad and I was like oh this first of all your house is really nice like I thought it was really nice the hot tub (laughs) the um the knife holder (laughs) (laughs) Wendy has this knife holder that is in the shape of a man and it that's what you hold all your knives in so it looks like this guy's been stabbed like 20 times yeah it was my divorce present to myself <laughs> that's right um and i and then yeah so the house looked really nice and then um you had the picture of jezebel your she's a pomeranian um in a in a graduation gown <laughs> talking about how jezebel like, graduated puppy kindergarten or something obedient in school no she went to canine university okay canine university i'm sorry it was ivy league (laughs) so i also have a pomeranian and i was like this girl has got to be cool because a she has a pomeranian b it's still alive and they're not the easiest dogs to keep alive because they're tiny and fragile (laughs) so i was like 
I, you know, I respond to that. Or I well, I'm so gl- I'm so glad that you did. The rest is history. Our doggies brought us together. And it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh-huh. And I also, you know, I really want to thank you because you're the one that turned me on to IIN, which is the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And really, you know, I was already interested in health and nutrition and already kind of reading every single day and really yeah. personally interested in it. And you were already going to IIN. You had graduated yeah. before me and told me all about it. And I'm so glad I took your advice and signed up because it, you know, spawned my life's purpose and it got me focused on my life's purpose and I just really want to thank you for that. Yeah, I knew you would like it. I mean, because we had been talking so much about stuff and I was learning so much and you already knew so much and I was like, you gotta you gotta check this out, girl. So did you think I was like it because I'm a big fat nerd? Um, yes you're a nerd. No you're not big and fat. <laughs> <laughs> well that's up for debate. <laughs> uh, but you're also a Pilates instructor? Yes. Yeah, I do. I teach Pilates. Yeah, you're just doing Pilates. all kinds of fitness stuff. I know. I have a few different studios. Three different studios right now all over LA, Montreux, Studio City, even Santa Clarita. Believe it or not, right by Six Flags. Whoa. Sure. You're driving all over the place. You weren't lying when you said you were doing a lot of driving. <laughs> I spent a lot of time. Whoa. I spent a lot of time driving. That's why I have Sirius and I have a little back support thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whenever I have people in my car that, like a cute guy, I like throw the back support thing like in the trunk. Why? Are you worried they're going to think you're old? Because I'm like a grandma with my like back support. With your back support? So I'm like, huh, one second, let me just <laughs> clean a few things out here. <laughs> <laughs> and all your candy bar wrappers. Yeah. <laughs> Diet Coke cans, the contraband material. Oh my God. And so you teach at Soul Cycle also? I do, yeah. I teach indoor cycling there. I've been teaching there for almost, almost a year here in January. And um, yeah, I love it. It's so fun. I, actually, they emailed me today and um, they want me to make a. They're asking me for their blog what's in my shopping cart. So I have to figure that out, what I'm going to say. Oh, so they want you to do a blog post on their website? Yeah, they're like in their, yeah, I guess so. Oh, much. great. It's yeah. the start of your writing career. I know. Aww. Just like 12 things that are in my cart. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And so um, you're also an actress. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm how long have you been acting? I don't know, like a a while. I've been acting for a while. I do commercials and mostly comedy stuff. I did. um, I went through the program at UCB Upright Citizens Brigade, which is an improv training ground, awesome place. Um, And yeah, I do. I do like mostly comedy stuff. Done some stuff for Funny or Die and some indie movies, you know. Nice, nice. Well, you know, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm, you know, excited to move forward and ha- have you on the show. I think it's just going to be so much fun and give everyone a little, you know, just a little bit more entertainment and just learning about nutrition and how to be- get skinny mini and all that stuff. Totally. Tips. Yeah. So, everyone, I also have another announcement. There's lots of announcements today. I have lots of stuff going on. Um, but I have, I'm have not halfway finished with my first book called When Diet and Exercise Are Not Enough, which Woo! roadblocks to weight loss. And it's, it's going to be available for sale as an ebook on my website in about spring 2014. And on your website too, right, Kate? Yes, that's right. Your website is uh, fitness-bra.com. Yeah. And I was compelled to write this book because I had so much trouble losing weight after the birth of my child. And weight loss, it was just always a breeze for me. I could just, boom, you know, put my mind to it and lose, you know, two or three pounds every week. Um, But that wasn't happening any longer. And what changed? And, you know, my own weight loss struggle is I experienced so many of the roadblocks that commonly prevent weight loss, leaving millions of women frustrated, discouraged, and unable to lose weight and keep it off. 
So you're not going to find many of the roadblocks and weight loss solutions I reveal discussed at your doctors or Jenny Craig's or in most weight loss books. And because of my own frustrating experience, I felt compelled to write a book. So every invaluable tidbit I discovered is all in one place because it's difficult. I, I mean, it just I have one tidbit in another book, and you just have to read so many different books, and there's so many so much wrong information out there uh, that I just really felt like I had to write this book. So I'm really excited to share what I've learned and help you pinpoint your roadblocks to weight loss because I believe that weight loss should not have to be that difficult. So let's get on with the show. Our guest, Jonathan Baylor, is an accomplished inventor, entrepreneur, philanthropist, researcher, author, and public speaker. And he holds more than 25 U.S. patents, including the Mark feature in Microsoft Office 2010, which we all use every day. And he has started two successful companies and the nonprofit nutrition education effort, slimissimple.org. He hosts a top-ranked iTunes health and fitness podcast called uh, the Super Science of uh, the Sorry, the Smarter Science of Slim. And he has authored the Smarter Science of Slim, um, his book which is endorsed by top doctors at the Harvard Medical School, Johns Hopkins, and UCLA, and is now releasing the groundbreaking book, The Calorie Myth, with HarperCollins in 2014. Hello, Jonathan. How are you? I'm wonderful, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So how do you do all these things? I mean, when do you sleep? Do you have adrenal fatigue or what? <laughs> uh, what is I forget. Who is it? Maybe Nietzsche who said... He or she who has a strong enough uh, why can do any how or how, why, some sort of, I'm trying to be, clearly I didn't sleep enough last night, but <laughs> it's all about having a compelling why, and if you can get that why to be compelling enough, I, oh, as you know, you know, doing the great work with your podcast, when, when, the, uh, when the why is there, the what and how become a little bit easier. Yeah, I know what you mean, because when I work, it almost feels like I'm not working, and I can just, sometimes I work for 17 hours straight, and I, it just doesn't feel like it. At one, there's a that researcher from totally going off on the tangent here, but I know we have some time. So the um, the, the researcher from the University of Chicago, uh, Mihaly Chiksen Mihai, the gentleman who came up with the idea of flow, right? That's his whole thing of if we can just be in that state of flow, that is really a state of happiness and well being. So certainly, uh, it's all about being in flow. Oh, absolutely! And you are in the flow, my man. <laughs> So, so first, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and what prompted you to go on this odyssey of pouring through 10,000 pages of research papers and write The Smarter Science of Slim, your first book? So we talked about that burning why that drives me and that, that, that story is the story of the formation of that why. I, I'll start way back in the very beginning and that I grew up in a very academic household so I have both my parents are college professors and uh, mom is an English professor, father is a philosophy and ethics professor so our dinner conversations were always very interesting <laughs> and also have a much older very athletic brother so growing up very academic household and a very athletic brother who I looked up to and I was a very skinny slinky child. So I wanted to be big and athletic like my brother. So I started to do everything I could to learn how to manipulate my body through food and exercise. The thing that was unique about my experience was that I was trying to gain weight. And I know that sounds a little bit odd, but it's such a key part of my story and I'll get to it in a moment. But so I spent years and years and years doing everything you would traditionally do, right? Reading the magazines, becoming a personal trainer, training other people. That's the way I paid my way through college. And all throughout that time, my goal was to get big and strong to be like my older brother. But I experienced something very profound during that time. And that was, I was literally eating of Excel spreadsheets that were tracking this 6,000 calories per day. Wow. In an effort to make my body bigger. And, you know, I was a football player trying to get bigger. And my clients, who I was a trainer over at Bally Total Fitness back in Columbus, Ohio, were predominantly women above the age of 35 who were eating and exercise as they always had been, but started mysteriously 
gaining fat. So I did what any good personal trainer would do who has been trained in the classical theories and said, you need to eat less and exercise more. So you need to eat 1,200 calories per day, do at least an hour and a half of cardio at least five days per week, and if you eat less and exercise more, you will get smaller, and by that same logic, if I eat more and exercise less, I'll get bigger. Wendy, neither one of those things happened, and I had to ask myself a question, and that's, like, how can one, how, I mean, we're, we're all homo sapiens, so how do you have one homo sapien who's consuming 6,000 calories and not exercising a lot, who is not getting bigger, and how can you have another homo sapien who's consuming 1,200 calories per day and exercising chronically and not getting smaller? There has to be something else going on. So then I felt like a failure as a trainer. Not only could I not help myself, but I couldn't help my clients. I was actually hurting my clients. And then the geeky side of me kicked in and said, well, Wendy, there, there has to be something else going on. Like there has to be an explanation for this. And then I realized no one had ever actually asked the question, like, what is it about me? Like I was a naturally thin person. Like what is it about naturally thin people that makes them naturally thin? And what is it about people who are not naturally thin that makes them not naturally thin? And what is it about age? Like, why is it that literally if you can take yourself at 15 years old and take the food you ate and the exercise you did and do that when you're 45, something very different will happen? So, like, what is going on there? And, and that all got lost in these theories about calories and metabolic math. And so, Wendy, I just... I did the only thing I had left to do, and that was to really turn on my geekiness and say I've exhausted all traditional avenues for education on this subject. I am a trainer. I'm supposedly an expert, but what I've been told isn't working for me or anyone else. So I turned to the academic research, and it did not take long in reading the primary research. So these are journal articles that you can't just read. You have to have a subscription to, or you have to have access to an academic library. Like it's, it's very difficult. There are some you can get, many you can get on the website called PubMed, but there's a lot that you cannot get or cannot get easily. And even if you get access to them, they're incredibly hard to read. But once you actually start reading them, if you're able to tolerate the boredom that comes along with that, you start to see that there is this massive disconnect between what the mainstream theories about eating and exercise are and what has actually been proven in the research. Wendy, it is it is staggering. Literally the first three years that I was doing this, like any good researcher, I was trying to find data that supported what I already believed and I literally could not find it. And I remember a distinct moment of sitting in my room and saying, how could it be true? How could it be true that eating less and exercising more is not the key to weight loss? And then I had this amazing light bulb go off, which was, Jonathan, how could it be true? Look at the world. Like ever since we were told to start eating less and exercising more, which actually happened in 1977 when the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and something else told us to eat less and exercise more. That's also when calories became mainstream. That's also when we started seeing a huge rise in obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. So like if I were to sit in front of a jury and try to prove that eating less and exercise more works, all you have to do is point outside to see that it doesn't. And then once you actually dig into the biology and the neurobiology and the endocrinology about what actually happens if you just take a nutritionally deficient diet and consume less of it, it's scary. So then the next seven to 10 years were spent saying, okay, all right, I'm not just gonna look for research to hopefully confirm my existing hypotheses. I'm just gonna see what's actually been proven. And that's what led to this odyssey, which has now culminated in over 1,300 studies being reviewed, collaboration with top researchers all around the world, emails, phone calls, just endless dialogues, because I feel a, based on moral mission, which is, very simply, we don't use the same computers we used 40 years ago. We don't use the same phones we used 40 years ago. Like every other area of our life, Wendy, we've seen dramatic technological improvement over the past 40 years, except the most foundational one, what we eat and how we exercise. We are being told the same things we were told 40 years ago, 
And the same things we've been told during the worst health crisis the world has ever seen. Why? It's not as if there's been no research and been no progress. It's just that we haven't been told about it. And that's why I work for 17 hours a day. <laughs> that was yeah. Long answer. <laughs> Yeah, because I know it. I've noticed also that the the mainstream knowledge is about 15 years behind the new research. It's just kind of always the, the law, Murphy's Law, what have you. Um, well, at least 15 years, if not 50. But yeah. yeah. And you must have a really good book because uh, the, super, the Smarter Science of Slim, because I paid $75 for it on Amazon because <laughs> it's out of print. So, yeah, yeah. Harper bought the the rights to it, so it is out of print, and now there's this like crazy black market for it. <laughs> I know. Well, I just I had to have it. I wanted to read it before I interview you on the show, and you know, of course, absorbed the knowledge. But I, I'm really looking forward to your new book, The Calorie Myth, coming out. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's coming out on New Year's Eve of this year, so right in time for that New Year, New You, but for real this time. <laughs> That's a good timing. Eh? That's smart. So let's start with the basics, what diet. Uh, what does the science show is the best diet for weight loss? Ah, well, what is the best diet for weight loss? So this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a non-answer here. I hope you don't mind. So <laughs> it, it's saying what is the best diet is a bit like, I know that's not what you said. You said best diet for weight loss, but popping out a more macro point. Saying what's the best diet is a bit like saying what's the best outfit. At least in my mind, like there is there is no best outfit. Like a, a cocktail dress may be lovely in one context, but if you're going to the gym, cocktail dress is not the best outfit. So the best diet for weight loss, and this is going to sound silly, but is one that enables you to lose fat, maintain muscle, boost your health, and enjoy life long term. Now there are some common denominators that are very clear in the science. For example, to the extent that any way of eating maximizes your intake of essential nutrients, vitamins, minerals, photochemicals, essential fatty acids, essential proteins, that's good. So maximize foods that provide the most of that stuff, minimize foods that provide the most garbage, metabolically destructive calories, processed things. People get hung up a little bit because there's a bunch of different ways to do that and people want to argue about like the different ways to implement that high order bit but the key is and it sounds a little silly but it is very simple once you cut through all the clutter and that's we need to eat that which provides us with the most of what we need the most of which is essential and the least of what we don't need so when I think this is like a lot of times when people get wrapped up about like protein or carbohydrate or fat, you just back up. What do we need as human beings to thrive and what foods deliver that most effectively with the least consequences? And what I found is if you need to make a general recommendation, the general recommendation, which then should be customized on an individual basis is first and foremost you should be consuming non-starchy vegetables as your primary volume of food so like half of your plate should be non-starchy vegetables these are vegetables you could eat raw you don't have to eat them raw but you could eat them raw think things you put in salads green leafy vegetables mushrooms uh, tomatoes peppers cucumbers asparagus broccoli things you could eat raw you can't eat potatoes raw you can't eat corn raw Non-starchy vegetables first and foremost. Next on your plate, so about a third of your plate would be nutrient-dense proteins. So these are things like wild-caught seafood or beef that was fed that which it is meant to be fed, which is grass, not processed garbage corn feed. Same thing with like a free-range chicken. So nutrient-dense, non-toxic sources of protein. And then the remainder of your plate is going to be whole food fats. So these are things like nuts, seeds, avocado, chaya, flax, cocoa, coconut, just delicious whole food sources of fats. And then low fructose fruits. So things like berries, strawberries, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, and citrus. Those foods unequivocally, and we can. this is what we talk about a lot in the book, is they are the sanest foods, meaning they provide you with the greatest amount of satiety per calorie. It, they keep you fullest the longest, and it requires the fewest calories to fill you up. 
They're unaggressive, meaning they don't cause a bunch of hormonal chaos in your body when you eat them. They're nutritious, meaning they provide you the most nutrients relative to calories. And finally, they're the least efficient, meaning it is very difficult for your body to convert them into triglyceride, a.k.a. body fat. So there's a bunch of different ways to do that, but that general template is a great guidepost. Oh, great. And clearly, optimizing your weight, your metabolism is key in losing weight. So how exactly does one go about increasing their metabolism? This is the uh, this is the sticky wicket here, Wendy. So the people often ask me. So I wrote up. I'm, I got this book called The Calorie Myth. So people see that title and then they see the subtitle, and that makes it even worse because the subtitle says how to eat more, exercise less, lose weight, and live better. And you're like, oh yeah, this is crazy. So you're saying like <laughs> calories don't matter and it's magic and like no 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 no. So here here's let's back up for a second here. So calories do matter. They matter. Uh, just like air matters, but that doesn't mean you need to consciously regulate your breathing. Like your body is designed to do that for you, right? Like nobody knew what a calorie was in the mainstream until the 1970s, 80s, and everyone was slimmer and less sick before that. So counting calories can't possibly be required for health. Yeah. Right? Like no animal counts calories, and we're a lot smarter than they are. So it's not that calories don't matter, it's that. The rate at which your body consumes calories, like your appetite, is regulated by your brain, your hormones, your genetics, your gut, and the rate at which your body burns calories is regulated by the same. It's a homeostatic system. It's a self-regulating system, just like your blood sugar, right? Like when you eat foods that cause your blood sugar to go up, your body automatically does stuff to bring your blood sugar down, and if your blood sugar goes down, your body automatically does stuff to bring it up. Right. If you sleep too little, your body does things to make you sleep more. And if you sleep a lot, then you can stay up later. Right. The body tries to maintain homeostasis. Like we all know this, but for some reason, we've been told that that doesn't apply to calories. So when you say, "How do we speed up our metabolism? How do we increase the rate at which our body burns calories?" That's really a function of two things. Our genetics and our hormones. So researchers estimate that about 45 to 75 percent of our body composition is very much genetically predetermined. And again, this isn't controversial, right? There's been three basic body types established for a really long time: endomorph, which is a bit rounder of a body type; ectomorph, which is a taller and lankier body type; and mesomorph, which is right in the middle, generally a bit more of an athletic build. Telling an endomorph that they need to eat less and exercise more to turn themselves into an ectomorph is like it's just just not a reasonable thing, right? Like, just not all of us can be six foot five. Not all of us can be ectomorphs. It's just not in the genetic cards for us. But there is a great percentage of it that we can influence, and the way we influence is by changing our hormones because our hormones are what control. All the things that happen in our body, our body essentially speaks hormones. So if your brain wants to talk to your gut, it's doing it with hormones. If your heart wants to talk to your leg, it's doing it with hormones, essentially, neurotransmitters, blah, 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 blah. So if our hormones change, everything about our body changes. And we, we've all experienced this, right? Any woman who's gone through menopause, any woman who's gotten pregnant, anyone who's gone on antidepressants, anyone who's tried to stop smoking, anyone who's experienced a great deal of stress, anyone who's gone on insulin, anyone who's taken anabolic steroids, any one of those things changes the hormonal balance in your body. And in real life, as well as in clinical studies, you can keep calories in the same and you can keep calories out the same, but weight will change because hormones have changed and therefore what your body is doing with the calories has changed. So the question of, well, how do we how do we burn more? How do we achieve that fat loss is we have to say, what is the hormonal profile of a person? Who is slim look like? And can we make our hormonal profile look more like theirs? And the answer is absolutely yes, we can. So we can take our hormonal profile that we might have at 45, and we can absolutely start to turn it back to the hormonal profile we had when we were 16. Can we get it all the way down to when we were 16? No. 
can we get it dag on close? Absolutely. So why can one person be thin and eat whatever they want, but the next person has to watch like every morsel and work out five days a week, and you know that first person just basically universally annoying? Is it just not <laughs> fair? So why is that? The as I mentioned, we, we have this homeostatically regulating system, right? So the body, everyone's body, works to maintain a stable weight. It's just that different people's bodies believe that a different level of body composition is appropriate for them. So like if you look at, for example, twins. So actually, let me just answer your question directly. Some people are lucky, and actually they're not lucky from an evolutionary perspective. From an evolutionary perspective, they're very unlucky because they just, when they eat more, they burn more. They don't store more. It's very difficult for them to store more. And up until recently, that would have been an evolutionary disadvantage, not an evolutionary advantage. So we consider them lucky today, but feel better knowing that for the entirety of human history up until today, they were unlucky, so they yeah. paid their dues. <laughs> but uh, also, and also this is again more of an anecdote, please do keep in mind that there are plenty of people who smoke their entire life and never get lung cancer. Do we know why? No. Like, they're just like, oh, that's, you, you certainly shouldn't smoke, even though, you know, Billy over there can smoke and doesn't get lung cancer. We don't know exactly why. We kind of know why here. And that's, if you look at metabolic studies, twin studies are very informative, for example, just to geek out for a second. So they do studies on twins. And these are really cool, right? Because then you have people who have, like, the Smith twins over here, and they have the same genetics. And then you have the Thomas twins over here, and they have the same genetics. And you would feed both the Smith twins and the Thomas twins a thousand more calories than they need per day. So as everyone would expect, that will cause a temporary weight gain. But here's what's crazy, Wendy, is like most people would think that if you fed everyone, like the Thomas twins and the Smith twins, if you fed them all a thousand extra calories per day, for 35 days, right, that's 35,000 extra calories. We all hear that there's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat, so everyone gained 10 pounds, right? Well, no, actually, no one will gain 10 pounds. No one has ever gained 10 pounds in any study ever conducted. No study ever conducted has shown that the calorie math we're taught is true. Every single study ever conducted shows it to be false. So no one will gain 10 pounds. But what you'll see in that study is the Smith twins they will gain the same amount of weight. And the Thomas twins will gain the same amount of weight, but like, well, the Smith twins will each gain two pounds, the Thomas twins will each gain eight pounds. Like there can be up to a 400% difference in the amount of weight gained between those two pairs of twins. So you see the hugely important role genetics plays in there. So there's that genetic deck of cards we're dealt, but we can optimize within that. So for example, if you look at the difference between men and women, it is easier for men to burn fat than it is for women. Why? Men have more testosterone than women. Testosterone is an anabolic hormone. If you take a woman and you inject her with testosterone, she will burn fat and build muscle without moving a muscle. Same thing applies to a man. If you take a man and a woman and you inject them with insulin, they will store more fat. So we have certain hormones which help us to burn fat, and we have certain hormones to help us to store fat. At the most basic of levels, Someone who eats more and burns more just has more of those fat burning hormones and likely has less inflammation in their brain and a healthier set of bacteria in their gut than someone who eats more and then stores more as a result. So the three main differences are in the, and, and to be clear, Wendy, there is individuals who are just slim and that's healthy for them. And there's individuals that are not as slim and that is healthy for them. But if someone is unhealthfully not slim, you'll see three things characteristically different in those people than you would in someone who is healthfully slim. And that is they will have inflammation in their brain, specifically in the hypothalamus. This is the area of the brain that controls our body composition, appetite, satiety, things like that. You'll see characteristically different profiles of gut bacteria or their second brain will be different than a naturally thin person and also their hormone levels will be different. For example, studies have shown that some obese individuals will have 25 times 
the level of leptin, the hormone leptin, circulating in their blood than someone who is not as metabolically dysregulated. And that's a function of their body trying to re-regulate their weight, but because they have a leptin resistance because their brain cannot react to that hormone properly their body keeps producing it producing it producing it. it's knocking on the door knocking on the door but it can't get through yeah yeah and yeah that's what i was getting at like what are some of these profound differences like the hormone differences and the the gut bacteria differences and regarding hormones is that could be possibly due to adrenal fatigue or to what other kinds of hormonal differences are there between people with a slow metabolism and a fast metabolism. So, uh, as I mentioned, there, I mean, there's, there's myriad hormones, right? Like estrogen, uh, norepinephrine, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on and on. The key thing, I think, is not necessarily knowing, because I actually think I have a list of this in the book, where it's like, naturally thin people generally have this kind of a hormonal profile. Naturally not so thin people have this kind of, of a hormonal profile. The thing that I think is most interesting is how do we change that hormonal profile to be more of one that seeks to burn fat rather than to store fat. And that is actually very, very simple, is we avoid processed starches, processed sweets, and processed fats. If you avoid those three things, your body will naturally regulate you around the weight that is healthy for you. Now, that is very different from saying that your body will automatically give you a six-pack. Those are not the same things. It's not natural for most people to have a six-pack, but it is natural for almost everyone to not get diabetes and to not be obese. Right In the early 1900s, the obesity rates were sub-5%. Wow. Over a, about 100 years ago, Wendy, one in every 4,000 people was diabetic. And to not get sick without thinking about it for your entire life, that is the natural state of human existence as evidenced by every single generation of people that have lived prior to the current ones. Yeah, and so tell me a little bit about um, like some of the more popular diets that people are doing that are sabotaging their weight loss efforts. So the most common dietary approach is the one that sadly I and everyone else that was tr schooled in the traditional theories preach, which is they're all variants of eat less, exercise more. The most con If you just ask someone on the street, go outside, ask 10 people on the street, if you want to lose weight, what are you going to do? They're going to say, I'm just going to eat less of my existing diet, and then I'm going to wake up early and jog. So sadly, so that person is doing exactly what they've been told, and that's the travesty, and that's why we have to work to fix this. That, but what that person's been told, literally three for three, all three things are counterproductive. Taking an already nutritionally deficient hormonally damaging diet, which is what the standard Western diet is, and just eating less of it is is terrible for you. Like you will experience nutritional deficiencies, your body will start to thrive and, and crave storing more fat, it will slow down, it will burn muscle tissue, it will set you up for long-term fat gain. And then if you sleep less, well that causes you to get into the adrenal, adrenal fatigue, we get into all kinds of cortisol problems, we see suppression in sex hormones, not good. Sleep is therapeutic. Most people would be better off exercising less and sleeping more. And that's a very, very easy trade-off if you just give yourself the opportunity to do it. Not that exercise is bad, but sleep is even better for you. And we live in an under, uh, underslept culture. I don't know if that's actually a word. Yeah. And then they do chronic cardio especially if you're a woman, especially if you're a woman. Chronic cardio, a.k.a. high impact, moderate intensity, things like jogging are bad for your health. Not only are they not helpful, they are bad for your health. Now, let me be very clear. If you like jogging because it makes you happy, that's fine. But if your goal in jogging is to create a body that naturally pursues health and slimness, you would be much better off doing other forms of exercise. It's like, Wendy, if I, if I told you, hey, Wendy, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna get healthy, I'm gonna go box. 
you'd be like, why in God's name would you box? Like, why don't you go <laughs> do something else? Because boxing has all these other impacts on your health. Jogging and chronic low-grade cardio like that in terms of your, your thyroid hormones, cortisol levels, impact on your joints, not good stuff. So in terms of these common diet approaches, eat less, exercise more, I will go so far, is the cause, like the idea that you need to do that is the cause of the modern obesity and diabetes epidemics because it is not sustainable. It's like telling someone just sleep less or just try to go to the bathroom less or just breathe less frequently. Like no one can be hungry. You cannot be hungry your entire life. Maslow in his hierarchy of needs told us a long time ago, food is a pretty basic human desire. And that's why statistics show that these eat less, exercise more approaches have a 95.6% failure rate. Wow. Shocking, and to put that in perspective, so that's a 4.6% success rate. The American, I think it was American Cancer Society performed a study on the success rates of quitting smoking cold turkey and keeping that, keeping, uh, keeping up not smoking. And keep in mind, Wendy, that nicotine is the third most addictive substance in the world, trailing only heroin and cocaine. So the long-term success rates of without any help, giving up something that the only substance is more addictive than it, are heroin and cocaine, that success rate, 5.5%. So it's low, but it is still higher than that 4.6% success rate of keeping weight off our body and being healthy for the rest of our lives via what I was taught as a trainer and what we hear about every single day in the media. Yeah, this is exactly the problems I have with my clients that come to me for weight loss is that they're all doing those exact same things. They're starving themselves, they're going to bed hungry, they're doing cardio five days a week and they just are not making the connection. They just do, do not believe me that they don't have to work that hard to lose weight. <laughs> and Wendy, the thing that's such a challenge for individuals like me and like you, and and I, because I've thought about this a, a lot, like how can how can this continue to live on? Like how can this biggest loser approach to weight loss continue to live on? And the reason it continues to live on is because if if we think like our goal is short term weight loss, like it does cause short term weight loss, but I don't actually think that's our goal. Like that's like telling someone with a fever. Someone with a fever, the goal isn't actually just to get rid of their fever. Because if that was their goal, you could just submerge them in an ice bath and their body temperature would drop. I mean, if you just want to get weeds out of your garden, you could just blanket your garden with gasoline and it will get rid of the weeds, but it will kill everything else. And if you keep your body in an ice bath for long enough, it will make your fever much worse. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that's the problem here, right? If you eat less and you exercise more, your body will burn off everything, but it will set you up for long-term fat gain. So we see people, quote unquote, have success, but what they're having success with is this temporary weight loss where our real goal is long-term fitness and health. And that goal, that different goal, requires a different approach because it's a different goal. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely stress with all my clients, they have to think long term and stop thinking short term. And long term, it, you know, it can take a little bit longer to lose weight. But in the long term, they'll, they'll keep the weight off. Exactly. And they will set themselves up. And, and Wendy, that's the, such a key point, too, is it's not weight loss. That's the issue, right? We've all lost weight. It's very, it's very hard to find an American who has not lost weight at some point. However, it is much harder to find an American who has effortlessly kept that weight off. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really after. But Wendy, here's what's so promising, and this is what the research, the modern research shows, is effortless fitness and health is the natural state. It has to be. That's how everyone existed prior to the modern generation, right? Like we want to like talk about all these different things that are going on and it's so complicated. And it's just like everyone who, who didn't know what a calorie was, didn't 
gyms didn't even exist. And you don't need to go back to hunter-gatherers. Like, that's super interesting conversation to have, but that's not even necessary. Just go back a few generations. If you look at the research, Wendy, the research, like the medical research, as early or as late, however you want to think of it, as the 50s and 60s, said that exercise was bad for women. So not only, so like how could too little of something we did even less of before we had a problem be the cause? Like, it's not hard to not get lung cancer. Just don't smoke. Mm -hmm. We now know the cause of the metabolic dysregulation which underlies obesity. Because it's the dysregulation of the body's ability to keep you at a slim and healthy weight naturally. Instead, your body fights to keep you at a heavier weight naturally. We know the cause. It's non-controversial. It's processed starch, processed sweets, and processed fats. It's that simple. If you find one person anywhere who eats no processed starch, no processed sweets, no processed fats, and is struggling with their weight, you can't. Well, let's talk a little bit about calories. Um, this, you know, a colleague of the day was mentioning how Harvard came out with a study that said that the calories in calories out theory is in fact true. And uh, like, you know, you have a new book coming out called The Calorie Myth. And this prevailing theory of nutrition is something that scientists, they just can't seem to shake it. And uh, can you explain what's wrong with this theory and why scientists are still holding on to this myth? Wendy, the struggle with this is it's not, it's not so much that it's false. And this is by the author of the book, The Calorie Myth. It's that the way it's presented to us is false. So yes, fundamentally, calories in minus calories out is is relevant and it exists, but the body automatically regulates that. So calories do matter. Like a healthy person will become full and will no longer desire food when they've consumed enough calories to be at energy balance and when they expend enough calories to take them out of energy balance, they'll get tired and they'll want to sit down or they'll want to go to sleep. So calories in, calories out is a relevant equation, but what is irrelevant is the, the fictitious need to consciously control it. Right? Like breaths in and breaths out matters. Water in, water out matters. Vitamin C in, vitamin C out matters. The amino acid leucine in and the excretion of it matters. But we don't have to consciously monitor any of that other stuff. The body does it automatically. So it's not that calories don't matter, it's that the idea that you need to consciously count them has to be false. If for no other reason, because it is not only has it been impossible up until the past 40 years, but it continues to be impossible. Because even if you did attempt to count all your calories, one, your measurements would be horribly inaccurate. Two, it's, it's, it is literally impossible to measure calories out. Because, for example, uh, up to 30% of the calories you burn in a day if you eat sufficient protein can be spent simply synthesizing new tissue in your body. Your body can build up to 250 grams of new tissue per day. Your body's constantly regenerating itself. No cardio machine is gonna tell you about those calories being burned, right? Like, yeah. how many calories did your brain burn today? The liver burns about 600 calories per day. How do you account for that? You can't. So that's the myth. The myth is that we need to consciously control calories in, calories out, whereas we don't need to consciously control any other mission critical function in the body. Does the distinction make sense? Yeah, and I, I knew this was the case because uh, so many days I spent contemplating how a pound of fat has 3,500 calories. So I'd be calculating, so if I, I go for an hour walk, I'll burn 100 calories. So I have to go on 35 one hour walks. Like, how is that even possible? It just <laughs> makes no sense at all. I knew I was right. Well, absolutely, well, Wendy, that, I mean, that math is so fun, and that's, that's how I started to free my mind from these myths, because 
if you just, you know, you chewing gum burns calories. So like, I think it's something like chewing gum burns seven calories an hour. Let's say it's 10 calories an hour because it's really, you're doing vigorous chewing. So let's say you chew gum for three hours a day. Well, let's make the math easy. 50, you do it for five hours a day. That's 50 calories per day. So per week, that's 350 calories. So in 10 weeks, you should burn a pound. Okay, so in a hundred weeks, you burn. So eventually, because you chew gum, you should weigh nothing. Yeah. And obviously, that's not true. And people are like, but no, that's absurd. Of course, the body won't let you do that. But Wendy, here's what's so empowering about like making that argument. Okay, so why is it that it won't make you weigh nothing? Why is that absurd? But the idea that it can make you weigh ten pounds less isn't absurd. Whatever mechanism exists in the body to prevent chewing gum from making you weigh zero pounds is the exact same mechanism that prevents it from making you lose 10 pounds. It's the homeostatic regulation of weight. It's your hypothalamus in your gut saying, oh, you took the stairs, that's fine, I'm just gonna make you hungrier. Or you jogged for an hour, that's fine, I'm just gonna make you more tired so you're less active throughout the day. Or you didn't go for a jog today, that's okay. I'm gonna use non-exercise activity thermogenesis to involuntarily move your muscles for you so that you burn basically the same number of calories per day. The body is really, really smart and it doesn't wanna starve and it doesn't wanna be over fat unless we break it, right? Like you can break your respiratory system and then you need a respirator and you can break your pancreas, and then you need to manually regulate blood sugar, and you can break your metabolism, and then you do need to consciously count calories. But we can avoid breaking it in the first place, and we can repair it without ever counting calories by just giving it the foods that heal it, the foods that we started the interview talking about. Yeah, and I, I love that, an, that analogy because... Um... I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so I haven't had enough coffee today. So, <laughs> so you know, I want to ask you the, the last question that I like to ask all of my guests. What do you think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? That, we've lo- that we have redefined food. The definition of food today is not the same as any other time in human history and is the cause of this modern deadly epidemic, right? We, we define, we now define, the average American gets between 40 and 60% of their calories from products that happen to be edible. I define food as something you find directly in nature. Like a moose exists in nature it's edible. Okay, moose is food. Tomato exists in nature's food. Cheerios don't exist in nature. There's no such thing as Cheerios tree. Bread also does not exist in nature. Things that are found in nature are food and have been food for the entirety of human history up until recently. And as soon as we start, and as soon as any other culture starts eating edible products rather than food, even if the amount of calories they eat stays the same, It breaks their metabolism, it breaks their biology, and they become heavy and sick, just like happens in any system. If you put kerosene in your car's gas tank, eventually your car will break down. If you flush paper towels down your toilet, it's going to get clogged. If you put things in a system it was not designed to handle, eventually it will break. And then just putting less of that stuff in will not fix it. It might slow the rate at which it breaks. This is why calorie restriction sometimes works. If you smoke one cigarette a day versus two, it will take longer to develop lung cancer. But the issue is not smoking fewer cigarettes. It's just breathe clean air. And that's all we need to do, Wendy, is we just need to eat food instead of eating edible products. Yeah, I love it that you call it edible products because... I I was appalled this morning, I went to my physical therapist's office, and there's a little lady at the front desk that runs the whole show, and it's 8.30 in the morning, and she's eating a Lunchables pizza and a Coke. 
Oh, no. At 8 o'clock in the morning, and I just, I was completely floored that an adult would be eating these foods, but this is what a lot of people are eating, and it's really, it's frightening. It has frightening impacts on our health. So, uh, thank you so much for being on the show, Jonathan. Uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about where they can find you and what you're up to these days? So there's two new websites in development. They'll probably be up when this show goes live. But in case they're not, start at smarterscienceofslim.com. So smarterscienceofslim.com. There you'll also you'll find not only a free 28-day program, which is really neat. Sign up for that. It's totally free. Points you to a bunch of great resources. Gives you interactive guides, recipes, all kinds of fun stuff. You'll also find our podcast, where I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Carrie Brown, who's a former English pastry chef, who now oh, shows no. us how people say, well, Jonathan, you talk about like a sane, I talk about a sane lifestyle. Well, what, what do you eat on a sane lifestyle? My answer to all these people are, well, what do you eat today? Because for any food that you eat, there is a sane substitute. So we can find that we've got sane ice cream, we got sane pasta substitutes, we got all kinds of sane goodness. So you'll learn about that. And then if, uh, so we got the podcast, we got the website, of course you can pre-order the book now, it's called The Calorie Myth, it's available for pre-order on Amazon, and pretty soon the book's website, calorymythbook.com, will be online, and then if you want to learn uh, more about the broader efforts we have going on, you can check out baylorgroup.com, but just go to smarterscienceofslim.com, check out The Calorie Myth on Amazon, and you'll be good. Oh, you have a little empire going there, I love it. <laughs> Love it. Well, Jonathan, thank you for being on the show, and thank you for bringing all these scientifically backed facts to demystify this very important topic. It's so hard to wade through all the information out there when you're just kind of learning how to lose weight and thinking you're going to get results, and there's so much uh, wrong info, and people are just so confused. Uh, so it's not surprising why so many people have problems losing weight, and I can't wait for your new book to come out. I've 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 actually already pre-ordered it on Barnes and Noble, and uh, so I'm really excited to read it. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you, Wendy. I would love to come back on when it's out. We could chit chat about it, and, and hopefully it'll be fun. Absolutely, I'd love to have you back on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Wendy. And everyone out there, if you want to find me, you can go to live to 110com I started the site to educate you about paleo nutrition and the importance of detoxification and how to treat your health conditions naturally without medication and all kinds of good stuff to help you live a long, healthy life. And thank you all you listeners out there for tuning in to the Live to 110 podcast. Go leave a review on iTunes if you enjoyed what you heard on the show today, and I will talk to you next week. <laughs>